So I'm going to hand over to J-Mac. Cool. Awesome. So uh, this is crafting maintainable Laravel applications. Um, I'm excited to be speaking to you all this afternoon, uh, or this avo in Straya, apparently, is <laughs> how we say that. Uh, I love abbreviations, uh, as you probably saw from uh, one of my previous Laracon talks, uh, practicing Yagni. Uh, and to that point, so much, I have abbreviated my name, Jason McCreary, to JMAX. So again, this is who you all know me as. Uh, you probably also know me from the base code field guide, hopefully, uh, maybe more specifically the, the recent podcast. We do mini-series, as Jess Archer, uh, co-host, mentioned earlier on different programming topics. So we started with the base code practices, and now we're talking about testing. Uh, but probably more notably, uh, Shift. So any Shift users out there, hopefully? Yes, good, thank you. Uh, so I don't say this necessarily for uh, completely shameless self-promotion, uh, but more so to kind of relay some stats. And I have 20 years of programming experience, so I've written all sorts of different languages, uh, everything from uh, PHP is kind of my bread and butter, but also things like Ruby, Objective-C, .NET, hated it, uh, Java, and so <laughs> forth like that. Uh, but also, again, as uh, Michael pointed out, over 20,000 Laravel applications have used Shift. And not only are there some metrics on this, which I talked about in Laravel by the Numbers, uh, but also the support emails that come in. People who have problems maybe using Shift because of things that they've done inside of their application. And so for those reasons, I've kind of curated all this down into 10 tips for uh, maintainable, again, crafting maintainable applications or maintainability. And if you've listened to any of the Base Code podcasts, you know that maintainability is synonymous with code readability, code approachability. So keep that in the back of your mind. We'll try to get through these in 30 minutes. It ran 38 this morning, so we'll see if I talk as fast as Matt Stauffer to get through all of these. Okay, in reverse order, uh, number 10, stay current because I want you to buy a shift. No, just kidding. Uh, LTS is a trap, in my opinion. I talk about this in more detail. Uh, even uh, Taylor kind of alludes to this as just being feature parity with some of the other frameworks that are out there in the world. Um, I've seen applications fork the framework uh, to do things, older versions, uh, to kind of run on PHP 7.3 or whatever to get 4.2 to run. It's just, it's sad, really. Um, they've also snapshotted the vendor folder in a way because certain packages have become abandoned. So when your application becomes behind, you resort to these extreme measures. And again, these things might seem silly, but these happen in the real world for applications that need to continue to run. So I'm not necessarily trying to knock them to spin it maybe more in a positive light. The, by staying current, we get all the latest features, right? We get all the new things that are built into Laravel, not only in the major releases, but now also the minor releases. There are things coming out. We get all the latest package support, right? We don't have to worry about necessarily abandonment or whatnot. The services, you know, all these great things that are coming out even within the ecosystem and from Taylor, like Vapor, for example, always run on the latest. It's not LTS, it's the latest version. So by staying current, we get to take advantage of those as well. The language itself, PHP. If you're running PHP 5.5, you are on an unsupported version of PHP. Now again, technically you can probably force that to upgrade to 7.3 or whatnot, but Again, you're just kind of creating this drag, and that's kind of the final point, is you kind of hinder growth of the community, right? No one's writing posts about Laravel 4.2 anymore, right? Like, you're just not helping the community evolve in any kind of way. So, all these reasons to stay current. All right, number nine, adopt the standards. And what we're gonna talk about here is a bit controversial, I suppose, but uh, coding standards <laughs> are what I wanna talk about. Uh, Laravel has its own coding style. I don't necessarily agree with all of it myself, but by adopting it, again, we create something that's a bit approachable as we work across multiple Laravel applications. Some of us may only work on one Laravel app, but I'm sure many of us probably work on multiple. I know I do, right? And it's just nice and approachable to go in and kind of see that it's formatted, at least with consistency. Again, there are parts of this I don't like, right? I really hate that space between the not operator. I don't like the no spaces between the string concat operator. But when in Rome or when using Laravel, I try my best to adopt these and go for it. So again, try your best not to customize these. Uh, I know we want to, in a way, code style is much like our clothing style, right? It, it identifies us you know, uniquely in a way, right? It's, it's a sense of style. 
And that's fine, okay? So if you must customize it, I encourage you to automate it. Uh, you can do this with PHP CS Fixer. If you do that uh, and drop the PHP or the .php CS file in your project, you, uh, or Shift will automatically uh, honor your coding style, so it won't uh, do the random Laravel one or whatever, or random to you, I suppose. So, uh, one more piece on adopting the standards. I still see applications that use what I call a vanity namespace, and despite Taylor and Jeffrey Way and so forth uh, kind of abandoning this pattern long ago, and even the command that helped you do this has been pulled from the framework, people are still doing this. And it just creates a little bit of friction in your applications. Uh, again, it's kind of like that personal style, but if we look at the kernel file alone, there's 23 instances of class references in this file alone that have that app namespace. So if you're uh, overriding this yourself, it's one of those things where now you're going to have to, to change this in multiple locations. And I know it's just search and replace, but now anytime you copy something from the docs or Stack Overflow or Laircast, you're having to change that. So it just creates that tiny bit more of friction, tiny bit more of maintainability. So just go with app, keep it simple. One bit I will say though, uh, as far as coupling goes, whether you're using a vanity namespace or not, I do encourage you to namespace your uh, relationships, your model relationships, if you're using any kind of polymorphic or dynamic relationship. Okay, this, this gets stored in the database as a value, so if your structure of your application changes, now that relationship potentially breaks. But if you use something like MorphMap and come up with your own naming convention here, for example, just a model prefix on all your different models, you decouple that. And we'll see today that a lot of these tips that I'm talking about are all about coupling, just tweaking that, sometimes increasing the coupling, sometimes decreasing it to kind of get that balance of maintainability. All right, number eight, default to structure. I'm sorry, Frake, but you are wrong. <laughs> no, you're not wrong. There's caveats. How about that? Uh, so we start with this app structure here. And what I see in a lot of applications, especially older applications, uh, is that they've done kind of exactly what uh, Frake was talking about earlier. They do some kind of modules or domain subfolder within the app. And I get this, right? It gives you that extra bit of organization. I, I completely understand it. But often when you crack these uh, sub-organizations open, you'll kind of see that each one of these uh, really just mimics the top-level app structure. You have controllers, you have models, you have events, you have providers, whatever, right? It's all just replicated. And this is actually a code smell. It's parallel class hierarchies, or more specifically, parallel inheritance hierarchies. And this is an original code smell from refactoring. Oftentimes, when you create this structure, what you have to do now is you have to maintain that. Anytime you create something here, you normally have to create the parallel class or the mirrored class somewhere else in your application, right? So these have trade-offs. So again, not saying necessarily don't do it, but understand the trade-offs that exist. So if you adopt this practice in all of your projects and that's your standard, then great. But this is not something that you really necessarily want to do the second you open up a brand new Laravel application or when you're getting started. Again, it just creates that friction, especially if you're in a situation where you're jumping between projects. Just that little bit of difference. This is kind of the number one thing when I polled developers of like, hey, what do you hate when you, you know, crack open a Laravel application? And this is it. They, they hate when they see a completely kind of random uh, directory structure. It just doesn't feel like home, right? It's just not what you're used to. So it's just a little bit of that mental overhead that happens. So what we can do is we can, of course, collapse this back to the top level. After all, the app folder is our domain. There's no reason to make a subdomain. It's it's all just the app folder. Laravel provides us plenty of folder structure uh, that's here. Uh, some are generated, of course, when we use artisan commands. So out of the box, it's a little bit trim, but there are a lot that are given to us. Uh, so for example, if we have events, we can just kind of reorgani whoops, reorganize this if necessary. Same thing with models, but oftentimes you'll find that when you're collapsing this, you start to see that redundancy. It's a little bit silly. So if we think of something like providers, these are already prefixed with app service provider or event service provider. So it's just a little silly to kind of have that organization above it. So a lot of times in collapsing it, you'll find that you don't need that much organization anyway. Sticking with folder structure a little bit, something else that I see, uh, even with the default folder structure, is the question I get asked a lot on Twitter or in, in support emails or whatnot, uh, where does it go? Where do, where do I put this thing? If it's not one of these core folders, like where does it end up going? I kind of have a simple answer to start with. Just make a services folder. This seems uh, a little bit simple and it's kind of catch-all and it's gonna feel nasty at first, and it kind of is, admittedly. 
But the point here is to wait until you have more inside that folder, right? And so once you start to have additional things in there, you can take a look at that organization and then restructure it accordingly. So let's say in services, you start out with a lot of clients or facades. Well, you get three or four of those and you make a facades folder. Uh, maybe it has a lot of different interfaces or something or all top level. Well, we can mimic Laravel and call those things contracts, right? We're not going to call them impl like Java. I hate seeing that uh, when I crack open Laravel apps. Uh, or maybe we have uh, a lot of uh, compositions, so we have traits. So the point here, and we'll talk about this more later, is that we can create these folder structures, but we can start simply with the services folder and kind of see how it goes from there. So the gist here is really one of the base code practices, uh, rule of three. Uh, and what we're talking about here is effectively that future you is always smarter than you are now. So if you can defer a decision till a little bit later, you're often going to have the correct abstraction. All right, let's talk number seven, managing packages. I think we're behind. We'll try to speed it up. Uh, so managing packages, uh, Composer makes it super easy to install a package. We all love using packages. Uh, if we look at just a, a simple Laravel application, we see here that even graying out some of the Laravel core packages, there's dozens of packages that this thing uh, has and uses. So before I talk about kind of why this can end up being a problem, uh, just as a bit of a tangent, very often from shift analytics uh, or metrics of which packages are used, like the most popular package, a lot of the times I'll end up seeing development packages in the require block. Definitely take a look at this because uh, some of us have probably seen things like you can't run Laravel Dusk in production. <laughs> it's because you probably put it in the wrong spot. So that creates production code, not development code. It can make your deployments more weighted or worst case scenario, cause those errors in production. So be mindful that you're including these dependencies in the correct uh, spot. Okay, back to the point. Uh, what we can see a lot of the times with uh, packages is that when we use this code, it becomes coupled to our application. We're obviously using the pieces that are inside of it, but we have to realize in a way that we take on ownership of that code. It's not entirely ours, but our application does depend on it, and as such, we shouldn't really just be including things kind of willy-nilly because it's easy. We should take a little bit of time to evaluate them. So I'm going to use an old, old example here, but one that's probably maybe a little bit more common. Uh, is this layer cast commander package. This thing was super popular in 4.2, and anytime I do one of the, like, the human shifts where I help someone upgrade their application, I'll see this thing a lot, so much so that I built a script to <laughs> upgrade it to uh, Laravel jobs. But that's the point, is that these things change over time. And so when we crack this thing open, ev even though it's dated, uh, we'll see just like so many things are inside of this uh, commander package, but really this thing is just a trait that has one execute method on it. So when we crack that open, we see this trait, we see this execute thing, and all those other things, the translator and the service provider and the facade accessor and all those other things are just, we just don't really need them. Um, all it really does is take a command object, it does a little string manipulation to determine uh, what handler to use by naming convention, and that's it. That's all it does. It's just a little command bus. So it's a, it's a single 20-line trait, but now I have this now abandoned package that is preventing me from upgrading a 4.2 application, just one of them, for example. So while you can't necessarily uh, assimilate all packages into your code base, the point is, is evaluate them. If they're doing such simple things like this, you might not want that maintenance trouble of that author maybe not upgrading it with the quicker Laravel release cycles. This happens all the time, even with the most popular package, the Laravel Collective HTML package. Just the other week, uh, when 6.1 came out, they weren't ready for semantic versioning, and you know it broke a lot of uh, projects. So you know we see this in NPM, for example, with the whole string pad thing a couple years ago. So just keep that in mind, that this code really is your code once you start using it in your application. So if it's small enough, consider bringing it into the fold. All right, smooth bindings. This is uh, an area that I'm really interested in uh, and have a blog post that I'm, I'm kind of crafting and, and going to come out with here soon. Uh, but what I like to see in Laravel applications and what I think, again, makes your application easy and approachable is just having all of your bindings in one place and making sure that you're real strict about where these things go. So let's start with the app service provider. The app service provider obviously registers things inside of the container. Uh, so, for example, we have simple uh, things that we register, we can have singletons, we can have things that we new up with you know, other things in a little bit more of a complex way. And it gets even more complex than this if you want. 
but the point here, first of all, is that I want to go into an application and I want to see all my bindings here in the app service container. I don't really want to see them anywhere else. So there's some things that we can do with that to make it even easier. We can actually use some properties on this class. There's a bindings property of key value pairs that actually creates a nice clean registry. So if all you're really doing is binding a class, a, a contract to a concrete implementation, you can put it in bindings and that just makes it nice and easily readable, right? Similar with singletons, you can do the same thing. So in this case, it's not a typo. I actually have a singleton that just uh, uses that object directly. There's no uh, interface or anything. Um, it's just the concrete bit. So the key value pair is a little bit clunky there. I'm actually working on a PR to just, if there's no key value pair, it uses that uh, class directly. But we see this pattern all over Laravel. We see it with events, right? The events has the similar registry inside of the event service provider. Policies are now um, auto-loaded, depending on uh, that convention to use. Commands, same thing, they're auto-loaded. So again, if we can take advantage of all these things, uh, we have an app that's just a little easier to work with, a little more common uh, between the different applications that we work on. Broadcast the same, and then the last one I want to talk about specifically in more detail are the routes. Something else I see in applications is that routes, uh, they don't really honor the web and API routes that are available. And so even though we have both inside of this routes folder, often I'll see applications that everything is just in web, and then they either override the API middleware, or it's actually a web request. And what I mean by that is it's actually loading the entire web middleware layer. And technically speaking, that's not really an API call as we might expect. The issue here is that from a future maintainability perspective, if your API call is now relying on things like the session to be started or cookies to be encrypted or decrypted, these might not be things that are there in the future or run uh, the way you expect. So again, be very strict about your bindings here. If you have a true API call, it should be in the API routes file. If not, it's a web request, that's fine too, but don't masquerade it as what it's not. It can be confusing. All right, number five, configuring configs. The config files are the most changed file in Laravel. In fact, from 6.0 released in late August, just six weeks ago, the config files have changed 16 times, okay? No major version releases, just minor and patches, but they've changed that many times. And developers are not up to date on these, I, I know this. Uh, for a fact, and despite Shift's effort, they, they just get behind due to how quickly they change. But there's some things that we can do to make life a little bit easier. Uh, so what I see a lot of the time are very frivolous changes inside of the config file. So even though uh, the database config, for example, gives us an SQL light, what I'll see in applications is people will wholesale copy and paste this into a completely new driver, uh, give it a simple name like, for example, testing, and then they just hard code the database to be the memory database. This is fine, it works. Again, I understand why you might want to explicitly do this, but there are already hooks in place for us to do this uh, ourselves with the SQL light driver that exists. We don't need to copy and paste it, we don't need to change this file, and therefore we don't have to worry about going through and merging the individual differences when this thing changes so frequently. Instead, we should leverage the environment variable here, the database uh, configuration, and just give it memory, either in a .env file or better yet, for testing, in the PHP unit XML config file. On the same note, again, simple changes that happen. Uh, maybe instead of using env in every environment uses Postgres, they change the default here. I would argue that this just, again, isn't explicit. So why have the headache of just that one line change? Leave it the default, leverage that env variable. Now, there are things that, of course, get more complicated than that in the real world, I understand. Uh, so what I recommend in that case is creating your own config file. And I know the app config file is there and all these config files are there for you to customize and update. But it just, again, makes life a little easier from a maintenance perspective if you separate these. This file is loaded automatically by the framework. It pulls it in just like any other config file. We can reference it with the config helper with the shift dot prefix. And this isn't anything novel. This is something packages have been doing forever, right? So inside this shift file uh, that's custom to the shift application, uh, there's some things like where the executable is located on the server, um, the support email address, all these other things. And individually, we could nitpick these and say, well, that shift email address we could put in mail config. And uh, these bottom things like the GitHub and Bitbucket and GitLab connections, well, aren't those just services? 
Well, yeah, absolutely. Uh, you could put them there. But now I have to have the headache of maintaining them every time one of those things changes. In fact, these things change very frequently. Uh, Stripe, for example, which is very commonly used, was removed from services PHP in 6.0. So uh, again, these things, just because they're there now doesn't mean they'll be there tomorrow. So you know, make a best effort to move these somewhere else. Uh, it's just going to help make your application that much more uh, maintainable. So you can just drag and drop in these new files, whether manually or through shift or whatever. OK, number four, get in there. Avoid overwriting. All right, a lot of times in Laravel applications, I'll see uh, kind of what I call injected inheritance. And what I see here is, is typically in the model or the controllers, I'll see some kind of like base model. And this is, of course, to add functionality. It's an age-old object-oriented programming tactic. Totally fine. But uh, when we go and kind of look at that base model, here's where I start to, to take a little issue. So uh, maybe it does a little property thing overrided. So here it just kind of unguards everything to make the whole mass assignment just a little easier to deal with. Uh, but even worse than that is it basically wholesale copies and pastes the fill method uh, off the model and dumps it here and then does a little bit more things with unguarded, so whatever that custom code uh, to toggle that might be. Anytime you override code in this capacity, uh, it's no different than forking the framework. You, you are now responsible for maintaining that method, its method signature, it, the way it behaves, the tweaks, the service update or security updates. It's a lot of things to consider there, so I, I definitely uh, would be very mindful about changing that. Uh, instead, what I would recommend, too, is composition over inheritance. This is just something a, a little more modern uh, that you can do with your applications, and we'll talk about here in a second, is a bit more in line with the framework. So instead of injecting that inheritance, which may or may not be used by your, all of your models, uh, let's turn that into a trait, uh, communicate a little bit better that this is an unguarded trait, right, and, and what all that means. So that solves kind of the inheritance part, but let's talk a little bit more about that custom code, because sometimes we do need to alter Laravel's behavior. A lot of the times, if you take a look at the core code, you'll find that there are already some hooks uh, that are built in here, right? So uh, a lot of times, I'll see people change login, because they want to do a different thing when someone logs in, right? Well, if we take a look uh, at where you might just wholesale overwrite the login method from the authenticate user trait, uh, we see here that send login response. And again, you might be tempted to just completely override this. But if you look a little deeper, these methods are, are really precise. And what we see inside here is this authenticated method. And it gets the request and the authenticated user. And this method, by default, is actually empty. It does nothing, which ultimately just redirects you to whatever your redirect path is. But what that means is this provides a little callback, if you will, to allow us to override that functionality. So if we take a look at that method, instead of just copying and pasting the whole thing, we can find maybe these more surgical approaches to override things that are meant to be overridden. So in this case, uh, we override that authenticated method in our login controller, for example, uh, and we perform some additional actions. And as we saw, if we return something here, now we can even go so far as to control the response that happens. So, Take a look at those uh, for those hooks inside of the core code uh, as methods. They also exist as properties. Uh, so form request objects, for example, have properties to redirect. Uh, you can redirect to a route or a URL or even a callback method. And these are all properties. So if we override them in our form request object, instead of going back to wherever it was before, let's say I was using a modal, but if the validation failed, I want to take you to a fuller page to you know, help you through that process, I can control that with one of those properties. If none of those exist, take a look at events. Laravel fires all sorts of events buried within the application uh, or the, the framework code. So again, if we go back to that authentication code, even here there's some opportunities to fire different types of events. So when the authentication is attempted, there's an event fired. When the authentication passes or the login is successful, uh, an event is fired. And these events exist for all sorts of different things. There's, of course, the auth events. There's the model saving events that happen for observers. So if you use a model observer, you're already familiar with these. Uh, but there's save, there's edit, there's update, there's delete, there's deleting, there's pre and post. Jobs, when they are running or failed, uh, all get fired. Even migrations have events that get fired. So check the documentation uh, if you are needing to do something uh, pretty advanced to see if an event's fired to allow you to hook in that way. So all these things prevent you from having to override core code 
All right, number three, getting to the end. Grok the framework is what I call this. Uh, and really what this means is be a team player. <laughs> uh, do uh, the things that Laravel does. Don't be rogue, right? If you do these rogue things, it's going to be hard to go and you know, approach that application. Again, we want the application to feel like home if we're bouncing around between Laravel app. Uh, so one of the biggest things, really, and it, it seems simple, but uh, the blade directives. So many blade uh, templates just use if and else, but there's tons of expressive blade directives that exist. So instead of if is set, we can use is set. Instead of if empty, we can use empty. Instead of if user is authenticated or if auth check, we can use auth or conversely guessed. So all these things exist here. While most of the HTML directives have been removed, there are some around uh, the form. So we have method put and CSRF tokens, which generate those hidden fields that happen for us automatically. And of course, if you're doing anything at all with loops, check out the loop variable. It does last, even, odd, first, iteration, count, left. It has so many different things inside of there. You don't have to track any of those yourself. Grokking the framework really makes us dig a little deep again and try to find and do things the Laravel way. So when I come across code like this, which feels, in my opinion, very Java-esque, uh, it's this try-catch. Ju I've just never liked try-catch. They just feel very like verbose to me, right? So uh, what this does, uh, of course, is, is just uh, checks to see if there's a GitLab connection, tries to attempt to connect and add uh, the shift uh, user as a collaborator to your project, so shift can be run. Of course, if that fails in any way, I want to log that with a custom exception or throw that. And then I want to log the error uh, with some information so I can check that out. Uh, and then, of course, redirect them back uh, to try again. Now, again, uh, all this is pretty verbose code, and I already have this custom exception. If, now, you might think, okay, well, I can take that custom exception, and I can go to the uh, exception handler, and I can put an if thing in the report. And this is the old way to do it. But again, we can push farther. If we look at the framework uh, or the documentation, we'll find that exceptions now, if they implement a render or a report method, they'll perform that automatically. The framework will automatically tie in uh, those things. So I can take what I would want to happen or be rendered if this exception is thrown and put it on that render method uh, and then put my logic there. <coughs> that whole try catch block is gone. No registry in the event handler. It's all, again, grokking the framework's features by putting that in uh, the exception itself. So we saw this before, grok the framework with the, with the configs, right? Use the ENV variables where possible, leverage the defaults, do anything else custom off to the side. The providers take advantage of those uh, properties uh, and methods, keep everything in one place just like the framework does. No need to reinvent the wheel. Uh, we don't use a lot of inheritance in Laravel. Again, it's composition. Use traits, not necessarily inheritance like we saw. Things aren't called interfaces. Laravel likes to call things contracts. Do the same in your application. Again, make it familiar, right? And finally, embrace facades. I know people hate these things sometimes, but they're, they're really not that bad. In fact, they're very, very powerful. And a lot of the arguments people used to have against these have all been solved by Laravel. Like it paid attention to the, that feedback and it figured out, okay, well, uh, how do we deal with this whole static godlike capacity? How do we make it testable? All these things have been solved and we'll see that here in a second. What I really, really like about facades, uh, the only reason I didn't like them before was really the weight of them, kind of like we saw in that commander class. We had to have the actual concrete implementation and then we had to have you know, the accessor and then we had to register it with the provider and then maybe alias it in app config. There's just so many steps to make a facade sometimes until I think five, six real-time facades came out and I love these things. All right, so let's say that we have uh, this new payment service. I'm going to charge Stripe a certain amount to an email with a token, whatever. Pretty basic code, but we can see probably if we do some testing or just in general, that new is kind of weird. Why aren't we getting that from the container? It doesn't make it uh, you know, easily testable. And again, it also just, more importantly, doesn't really grok the framework. It's, it's just we're not taking advantage of some things that are available to us. So instead, uh, we can take that code, uh, kind of break it down in some different ways, get rid of that new by uh, just using a static charge method. And we could stop here and just leave it static, but we don't really solve that uh, kind of testability, right? We don't really solve that grokking the framework way. So even though this looks like a static method, if we scroll back up, we'll see that this is actually a facade. And more importantly, it's, it's a real-time facade. And the way we do that is we actually just reference our service object directly. So in this case, the payment service underneath that generic services folder. Uh, and then, more importantly, 
we prefix it with this dynamic facades reference. Laravel will automatically, under the covers, resolve this based on the rest of the namespace, new up an instance of that, and then allow you to call it just like you would any other facade. No additional work is necessary. So this is pretty awesome. And it has all the features of a facade does as well as far as testability is concerned, meaning that I can swap it out if I reference it as a real-time facade in my test as well. All the swap methods and the mock methods and the should receive methods are on that real-time facade as well. So makes it super easy to swap uh, code in and out or use something in a static capacity, much like the framework does. So again, crock the framework. Okay, a little bit uh, controversial to what I just talked about. Uh, number two, uh, honor the MVC pattern. Okay, uh, so Laravel is an MVC framework, uh, but uh, it's also very, very developer friendly with some of these facades and helpers that it gives us. And so because of that, it's really easy to blur the lines between uh, what traditional MVC might consider boundaries. So let's look at this uh, old uh, little chart here. Uh, it's a little bit fuzzy because uh, MVC has been around since 1970, so uh, this was probably built way back then. Uh, but we basically have uh, the browser that comes in just to refresh ourselves. And long story short, the controller uh, needs to be the mediator between the model and the view, uh, and then basically formulate the response uh, through that mediation. So implicitly what's built in here is that we shouldn't have a lot of view logic, right? We shouldn't be doing uh, you know, queries in our view, uh, super complex even collection pipelines, I would really argue against in the view logic as well. The view should basically be dumb, right? This is kind of an MVC thing. That also means, by correlation, that models and views really just shouldn't talk directly to each other. Again, the controller should be mediating that. And to that point, the model shouldn't be talking directly to the browser, or in this case, it shouldn't be inferring things directly off the request. So let's take a look at a piece of code here, pretty quick. Uh, we basically have this store method on the order controller. It's nice, it's readable, uh, it, it adheres to some of the base code practices, I would argue, but the things I don't like about it is it's kind of breaking MVC. So if we focus in, we have these nice creation methods, good names here, uh, and you know everything you would expect to kind of work. But Going a little deeper inside of this create for order on the user model, just kind of a, adhering to that fat models, right? We're gonna push that logic down, which I think is great. The problem really, if we go and look underneath the surface though, becomes down at this layer. If we take a look at this actual method, it's doing things like looking into authentication. This is a bit of a boundary, you could argue, right? Uh, it has to know intimate details about how to get the user from the authentication object. And again, Laravel makes this super easy, whether it's the helper or the facade, but it's just blurring those lines. We're kind of doing the same thing with the request. We're just using the request helper at the model layer to just reach out to the request and grab an arbitrary piece of data off of it. Why or how does the model know about this? It really shouldn't based on MVC. So we're kind of dishonoring that in a way. So let's look how to clean that up. Uh, if we go back to the order controller, We'll see this store, and what you'll notice is that we are injecting the uh, request object. This is, again, grokking the framework. Laravel does this for us automatically. Uh, but more importantly, if we can type hint that, uh, not just with the, request, the, re the generic request object, but actually a form request object, we can get additional things like validation as well. I'll come back to that because there's more. But what we're really doing here is not just grokking the framework, we're using a very simple pattern that gets us around a lot of these problems, and that's just dependency injection. We're bringing, dependent, we're bringing the request dependency in, and then we're passing it along to those things that are dependent upon it. So we see that we've added it uh, to both of those methods here. And now we can have a single object that we reference, and it should be responsible and knowledgeable about how to reference that. So we can get uh, the request that comes in, we can get the user off that request and pass it back if necessary. We're working off one thing now, not multiple global facades. Again, sometimes why it gets a bad rap. And even that request, we can get off the input now as well. Now, you might be arguing or thinking, well, that's kind of six in one and a half dozen in the other, right? So we're just kind of passing in this request, and it's still a little bit intimate about it. Well, let's go back to why I also like form request objects. In a way, they create a contract. All right, they create an implicit contract of what's valid data on that particular form request object. And this is why I like using these. I know the request validation uh, can be easy to do in line, uh, but it's another reason that I advocate for this, is now through the contract of knowing that the data is there, I'm communicating what this method is allowed to expect as data. So it's not just randomly grabbing data anymore, it's grabbing the email, which we know based on that contract or that type hint that has been validated beforehand.
All right, final thing here. Thanks for bearing with me. I know we're a little bit over. Uh, number one, write tests. If you ignore everything else that I told you here, you can get away with a lot of maintainability issues and overcome them if you have a test suite that you can run and see that it passes. Uh, and Laravel provides a uh, rich uh, testing framework for you. So when I crack open the test folders and I see that this is what you have inside there, I cry a little bit and I just think, oh my god, I don't want to work on your application. Uh, so again, Laravel makes this super easy just to run through this uh, very quickly. Uh, we have a test namespace out of the box, those feature tests. In this case, I like to mirror the directory structure. It just makes things easy to find. You can write these as uh, arbitrary feature tests if you want, uh, but I like that. I like adopting the uh, data uh, attribute as well here, where you basically just say test. That allows me to write a more expressive name. So going back to what we were just looking at, uh, store places order for authenticated user. I can kind of dictate what the requirements of this test are or what it's doing. If we take a look at the test itself, we can see all sorts of things out of the box from Laravel. We can generate factories, model data uh, directly. Uh, it'll actually store it in the database. We can use that SQL Lite testing database to make things nice and easy to set up. Uh, all out of the box. We can send a request post to that order store route. Uh, we can act as that user to automatically authenticate ourselves. All of this is built in. It's nice and expressive, just like the framework is. We can send data to it. So in this case, we'll just order a product with some kind of Stripe token. If we go down, we can have all sorts of powerful assertions as well that the database now has an orders record that matches the data that we sent in. Again, all built right into the framework. Makes it super easy to work with. Uh, and finally, we can assert that we basically got redirected to that show page uh, with that newly generated order. So that's a real running test on that code that we just looked at, all built you know, several lines with Laravel. So it's super easy to, uh, to write these tests. Uh, with that, I will close it up and give you a second to take a picture of this because uh, not just following me on Twitter for more information, I'm also going to tweet out a uh, kind of a uh, long blog post form of this talk here in just a bit with all 10 of these. Uh, you can listen to the Base Code uh, Field Guide podcast on your ways home. Uh, unfortunately, we don't have enough episodes for me to listen to on the way home because it's like 25 hours. Uh, that's a bit.ly link for that. You can use Shift, of course, uh, bit.ly link for that. The test and improve links go to Confident Laravel, uh, which is a course I released a few weeks ago. Uh, it has a 25% discount, I think, on there. So if you've been on the fence, take a picture of that. I ask that you don't tweet that out, please. It's just for you all as attendees of LayerCon. Uh, and also uh, the Improve, which is uh, the same discount for the Base Code Field Guide uh, digital book. So check those out. And I'll be outside, so please talk to me more. Thanks for bearing with me for a few extra minutes. And I'll see everyone at the after party. <laughs>